Hello and welcome to another edition of What Does the Giraffe Say Media with me, Kathleen Rotorne. We're an organisation. that aims to connect people to so Chris bear with me I think my Wi-Fi went a little bit wobbly there so hopefully that that still managed to work um, but Chris if you could tell us a little bit about yourself you've had a very varied career in conservation um, and what was it while you were working in conservation where you saw some gaps that prompted you to launch leadership for conservation Africa uh, Kathleen, thank you. Firstly, before I tell you about my career, um, my compliments to, for, to what you are doing and your initiative. Really uh, admire it. I believe that uh, the conservationists of the day are not the people who are necessarily all sitting out there uh, in the bush uh, doing some uh, rhino census or something of the kind. It's people like you that are the conservationists of the day. Well done and my compliments. Um, on my own side, um, maybe just one or two things which led to the leadership for conservation in Africa. I was appointed in Sand Parks as the head of tourism in Kruger National Park, which, we, which is still is the biggest money income generator for South African national parks. And at the time, simply because there were some, I would say, relationship issues and uh, I didn't know so much about tourism, I had to learn a lot about that. And then I started there doing tourism. And as we moved closer towards a democracy in South Africa, a lot of trouble started happening in South Africa where people started getting a voice and the local communities uh, raised their voice. And one of the ministers who later became the Minister of Agriculture, he then said, well, why don't we just simply cut the fences off Kruger National Park and chase the cattle in there? And, uh, and that's what we do. Uh, then we have enough grazing for the cattle. That was quite a contentious comment that he made. But anyway, so at the time, while still managing tourism, the head of, or uh, well, the director of Kruger Park then approached me and said, look, we have to do something around community lives and we have to reach out to the communities. And he asked me to spear at a new department, which we at the time called Community Lives and later it became Social Ecology, and uh, sort of working all around Kruger National Park, two international borders, Mozambique on the one side and northern Zimbabwe, and then on the uh, western side and uh, the southern side, South African people communities, to the amount of about 1.2 million people with touching, literally touching the fence of Kruger National Park. Started some forums there, or fora, 61 of them, uh, um, starting working with the communities and was actually very sad to realize that uh, the community liaison was actually only a reactive type of scenario. You, you poach our game and we respond and react and only the rangers sort of had the chance to speak to the community. So we started with that. So that happened and, it, it, and, and we created this whole new department. And then um, in 1997, the South African National Parks went bankrupt. And uh, we couldn't get any banks to lend us money. And at the same time, the government didn't want to bail us out. And we had to do something. And uh, the then director of Kruger Park, Dr. David Mabunda, um, he called the Exco together and they said, OK, what do we do? And we formed a committee uh, called the Business Performance Improvement Initiative. And I was the chair of that committee. And we said, what are we going to do to get ourselves out of the trouble? Because at that time, probably 75% of the income of Sandbox came through tourism in Kruger National Park. We also agreed that we cannot save ourselves out of trouble. We have to develop ourselves out of trouble. And then we started with a lot of new commercial initiatives. Everything from concessionary right to public-private partnerships, privatization, bringing in things that were holy cows in the past. And that initiative, not just in Kruger, but in all other uh, uh, Africa parks, South African parks, then saved us because we developed ourselves out of trouble. 
So in my personal capacity, I had a bit of a niche understanding the commercial side of things. And then when David Mabunda, who then after that became the CEO of Sandbox, when he had his inaugural speech, he said, Sandbox should become a world-class organization. And I simply said, you cannot be a world-class organization if you're not a continental player. And translocating a few animals here and there is not making you a continental player or maybe giving some technical advice. And then I said, David, we've got to move into Africa. And David always gave me carte blanche. Uh, we had a very good relationship. He said, what to do? I said, give me six months, I will come up with something. And in that process, approached the IUCN, approached a mining company called Goldfields to fund it. Uh, and uh, the, the guy who was the CEO of Goldfields, then Ian Cockrell is still uh, one of our founding members on our board, but Goldfields no longer on the board. But anyway, so we established this and went into Africa with the approach of conservation commerce, looking at national parks and protected areas as a product that we can use for socio socioeconomic development. And that's what we started focusing on. And sort of very much with that, uh, what we used to call conservation-led socioeconomic development, that was the Sandparks IUCN and now LCA footprint into Africa to assist countries and organizations. And those days, you know, it was still a very, very, uh, people were not so aware of the commercial opportunities. And we've developed uh, help countries in many countries in support of their own, whether it is commercial activities, privatization, both for their parks and for the communities around the parks. Um, so, in short, we focused on what we said before, the three C's, conservation, communities, and commerce, but we also later brought in a fourth C, which is consciousness, creating a consciousness in the minds of people or assisting in that uh, around the biodiversity protection and nature conservation. That, in short, is how it all happened, and uh, now we're still going steadily and happily forward. And one of the things that I really um, kind of admire about your organization is you're constantly looking at other ways to try and spread awareness, create engagement and build people up and empower. Um, and one of the ways that you're doing this is a, a project that you have, which aims to educate and engage um, is Screen Share Africa. Um, now, this connects different professionals to students with um, virtual presentations, but with an Africa-centric Africa um, kind of focus. Can you tell us a little bit about what kind of inspired that um, and kind of the feedback that you've been seeing both in terms from the professionals and also from the students? Um, firstly, we've got an incredible team of people running this. They are so dedicated and I'm so incredibly proud of them. Um, and it somehow happened through COVID. Uh, we already took a decision we have to rejuvenate. We already took a decision we have to link with the students all over Africa. That was already, that decision was taken. And then some of us uh, had a virtual pub once a week uh, when, when we had lockdown in South Africa and we met from all over the world and we would drink a beer together. And one of the guys then, I said to him, he's a specialist in pangolins, Rod Cassidy, and I said, Rod, why don't you do a talk on this new Zoom thing, you know, so everybody can watch some Zoom and, and you do a talk on, on pangolins. And Rod did that for friends and family. And that eventually uh, ended up in a uh, a, a, a talk show that we have every Thursday evening called Unlocking Nature because it was not time, a lockdown time. And in that process, one of the lecturers from Stellenbosch University asked a guy, Michele Menegan, who is, in, uh, is Italian working for Pan's Foundation in Tanzania, Michele, would you do this talk for my master's students? And there it happened. Just there it happened. Share screen. You can share knowledge in classrooms. And that happened there. So what is Share Screen Africa? Very basic concept. And it's uh, spearheaded by Johan Kruger and, uh, and his team. What it boils down to, we are specialists, people, knowledgeable people, practitioners. Are you prepared to donate your time to us? So they, they donate 10 hours. So if you, Kathleen, donate time to us, we say thank you. And then what is the topic that you're going to address? 
And then that topic we link to a number of universities or, or colleges or training institutes. And we stream it live. So you would have one lecturer presenting a topic or practical things uh, where you have five or six or nine universities in different countries listening to the same topic. And that goes on to YouTube. And then your additional hours is if one of these organizations or companies or, or training institutes said, hey, Kathleen, we need to chat to you a little bit more about this part of your topic, and then you donate that hours to finish your 10 hours. So that, in essence, is what share screen is. So we're very chuffed with that. And they've been running, and within a year, I mean, we are already rebuilding our whole platform because scaling is now a big problem. And maybe if you can briefly just go into the slides, then I'll just run through them very quickly just to give you some idea of where we are after a year. And again, with compliments to a very, very dedicated technical and uh, ex um, uh, a team of uh, technical and conservation experts uh, sitting in Kenya and in South Africa. So if you can see the first slide, here are just series of talks that they had, and I'm not going into every one of them. Um, like if you say uh, there's, for instance, a talk uh, that is, let's say, rethinking conservation. So that was, those were a theory, a series of talks. Rethinking wildlife security, bottom right. Series of talks on what you commonly would, we commonly would refer to as anti-poaching. So if you look at this, like in the first talk, the 11 talks, 12 speakers, country six, average viewers 28. Um, if you look at the one at the bottom, rethinking conservation, five talks, seven speakers, country seven, average 66. Uh, the one on, on the uh, rethinking wildlife security, 10 talks, 15 speakers, six countries, 114 viewers, students on those talks. So those are the type of statistics. And if you can just go into the next slide quickly, and then you will see, um, uh, go to the next one. It's fine. I'll, I'll just uh, check to that. Okay, this is where they are. So you will see in these slides, you know, it's not just a talk. People are in aquariums demonstrating things, uh, demonstrating how to handle a snake demonstrating how to, uh, in a canine unit, how to work with your dogs. While they are there doing it, and the students actually practically see it. I always laugh about it. Here in South Africa, there's a university called the Free State University, which is in the heart of South Africa, one of the driest areas in South Africa. And they have marine biology. So where on earth does a student in marine biology get exposure? So now we take the cameras to the marine biologists in, uh, in their labs and they learn about things like that. Just go to the next one. You can just sort of, uh, 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 after this one, here's a, a talk that happens on the ground. These students are sitting there, out there in the places where they work. Next uh, study, uh, next slide, you will see uh, if we can go to that one. Um, here, um, one of uh, uh, one of the students, uh, Chris, uh, Chris Lewis, not a student, specialist in jellyfish. He did a talk with live cameras in in the aquarium, and 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 demonstrating to the students. And the next one, uh, you can probably here's a guy demonstrating venom extract venom extraction from a snake, showing the students how to do it. Now, seven countries attended with an average of 59 viewers. So this is Share Screen Africa. And if you want to look at the statistics, just the next one, uh, briefly. Uh, statistics, talks, 54, speakers, 62, average countries per event, five, average students per event, 43. Next one. Okay, so... Lifetime videos viewed. So the videos are now on, on, on uh, YouTube. You can see it there, www.youtube.com forward slash C forward slash Share Scream Africa. Uh, 23,535 uh, uh, views. Hours viewed 747 on average gives you more than half an hour per view. Audience mostly age 18 to 44. 
And I'm not sure if that's the last slide. Let's just take a check if there's anything else. And thanks to Johan and Marie to compile these slides for me. And yeah, and then the result, I mean, the reaction is just incredible. It was an absolute pleasure being part of the discussion. Thank you for the opportunity. That is a presenter. And a blame it from the space student. Thank you very much, Nick. I've been heavily leaning towards a more ranger-based career path, and you have absolutely helped me make up my mind. Um, and uh, the Stellenbosch, uh, not the Stellenbosch, the uh, Free State University now uh, spend a lot of money to buy special apparatus so she, they can link to other universities and in specifically marine bi biology and parasitology. It's amazing. So uh, one of our um, impact areas that I'm very, very chuffed about. So that is uh, uh, Share Screen Africa, and I think the, the footprint is growing significantly. Uh, 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 in this field. And I think, I mean, obviously there was a lot of downsides that came from, from COVID, um, but it did also in, in one ways it shut down the world, but in other ways it opened up the world by um, technology. Um, so it has allowed for you to be able to do these kinds of initiatives. Um, are you finding that some of your students, and I know you touched on it a bit earlier then with marine biology, but they're looking a bit outside of the box, outside of um, what they might traditionally have been looking at because they've then been exposed to these different talks and these different ideals. Um, Johan mostly work with this, but my, uh, my deduction from all this is that the lateral exposure suddenly opened the eyes of students. And then, if, especially when you think about COVID, you know, if you think about COVID, in, during the COVID times, they were locked down and it was like in, there was an implosion. And, and this virtual type of learning brings an explosion of knowledge and ideas and thinking. And we recently, in April, we had our annual council meeting and we selected um, 10 students from five countries um, eight female and two male, of which five are non-conservation students and five are conservation students, who actually intended, attended our annual meeting. And what an incredible, fantastic experience for us and the students and this lateral opening of thinking and ideas. So I think that there's also a lot of good that came out of COVID. And we have to really leverage on that and help to grow and develop our students and learners uh, in every field. And following on from that as well, you also do a lot of work again in education um, where you're looking at school curriculums and how to fit in conservation education into that. Um, now you're working with various departments of education across different countries within Africa. When you initially reached out to the educational departments, were they initially receptive? Did it take a little bit of work? And have you seen any changes of attitudes here? Kathleen, I give you full permission to stop me when I, in my enthusiasm, keep on talking. All right. So I get to your question. Okay. Uh, just a background. Um, the LCA was asked to facilitate the African Leaders' Debate at the World Park Congress in 2014. And our chair of our organization, uh, Mrs. Sabina Plattner, she formed an organization called the Sabina Plattner Africa Charities. And with me facilitating this uh, Africa Leaders debate, I asked her to be a keynote speaker. And she's an educationist. Uh, and, and she did a keynote talk and we had to lead the African countries into what we called Sydney Promises at the time. And in her talk, she pointed out very clearly, if you look at the statistics that come from the World Bank, Africa will double its population by the year 2050. The average age predicted in Africa will be 17. 85% of the young people are urbanized. So if you think about education, and we as conservationists tend to think about those local communities surrounding the parks. Now, 
Kathleen, I have probably be, worked in 26 Africa countries. Remember, we're an Africa-based organization. And if you if you work together with and 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 you emerge yourself into those communities, they love where they come from. They love the bush. That's where they grew up. They they it's not like they don't love or care for it. Is they have a need for further development and knowledge and also to grow and develop themselves, but they love it. But what about the urban child? Where does the urban child really get into nature? They've not even heard in some of these countries of their national parks, never been there. So what Sabina Plata then said, she challenged the African leaders and said to them, if you call yourself conservationists, and you do not spend 50% of your budget on education. You will just build higher fences, get bigger guns, and you will not resolve the problem. And then she said, and my, my absolute gratitude to her, she then said, I'll put my money where my mouth is. And then we started with a program, joined LCA SPAC program called Edu Conservation. So what do we do? And then I come to the answering your question. Okay, remind me to answer your question. All right. And then what do we do? So we go into countries and we negotiate with the education departments. And then we say to them, we would like to enrich your curriculum with conservation content that naturally fits into your curriculum. And we will bring in the specialists to work with your department, to work with your inspectors of education to work with your teachers and to pilot this in 30 schools in your country and we on average have 6,000 students per pilot group in seven countries and then we start developing content which has a natural fit to their curriculum which is Africa Afrocentric and which speaks to the national value system and identity. So you're not going to see a picture in there of a kid standing under the Eiffel Tower saying something about conservation. But it's all we do, drawings and everything that is sort of fit the culture. Then we develop what we call teacher's toolkits. And these teacher toolkits then help the teacher and provide the teacher with content for every lesson over a year. And in the cool toolkit, you have all the apparatus they need and whatever is in that curriculum is in a toolbox where they have it ready to use with every one of the classes where they present this. So now to answer your question, is it difficult to get started in the countries? I think like everybody else, the, the, the departments of education, the people work very hard. Teachers work very hard. And you come with a concept, oh, we're going to add more work to what you are doing. Uh, you will also think twice if I do that. All right. So what we then do is we start negotiating. So, okay, we will appoint country, a country coordinator. You nominate, we appoint. Then we will do the training of teachers during their holidays, not during school time. And of course, we then pay them a bit of a per diem and we train them. And when they go through the training, they start liking it. And they then become our voice. And then as these two kids are developed, the higher echelon and the inspectors and the ministers see it. And then suddenly it opens up. Now we to the extent that we want to scale higher in the seven countries where we are, and no names, no pactrol. One of the countries up till a month ago said, uh, uh, e oh, we're not sure if you want to do this. And then when one of the, uh, with the country coordinator went to one of our tra training, uh, uh, um, training um, sessions, a uh, five-day training session in two countries, coming back with this toolkit concept, the, 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 the upper echelon said, we want it like in tomorrow. So you start slow, slow, you grow in this, and by now, it's, uh, uh, it's, it's, it's wanted. And they do it with such passion because they've, they've worked with it. They own it, not us. They own it. 
and and that's the whole concept around edu conservation and that we focus on the teacher because the the teacher is eventually the one that will be the multiplier of that knowledge going out to all the children that they will teach over a lifetime and that's my short answer to your long question <laughs> <laughs> and it's an absolutely lovely answer and I absolutely love the passion that you clearly show for the work that you're doing and also the fact that it is clearly having an impact and is tailored to the different countries and the different um, oh, the different curriculums which makes a huge difference for the students and for the teachers. Um, so I've only got a couple of questions left for you Chris and the one question I wanted to ask for you is I know that conservation can be particularly challenging. There's often a lot of negative news out there. It's a lot of hard work. It's a lot of sometimes two steps forwards, one step back. Um, if you're having a bad day, how do you keep yourself motivated? And um, what advice would you give to others as well to try and keep positive when sometimes it can be a, a little bit intense? Um. I, I have better days, never bad days, but let's try. Um, Kathleen, by training, I'm an industrial psychologist, and I could, you know, provide the typical textbook answer to this. But I'm going to be real, working with these things every day and not give you sort of a textbook answer. Let me just start with a little story. And this is a story I have so often use, and it's a true story. In 1953, the first woman who swam the British Channel from Dover to Dieppe was Lady Chadwick. And later she tried to swim the difference, the first time she attempted to sw swim the distance between the St. Kathleen's Island and um, the west coast of America. Um, she prepared herself early in the morning, and you can now think that was in the 50s, um, and they put grease on their bodies, you know, to, uh, to, for heat. And, and, and uh, they had assistance, a little boat next to them that provided them food. Them food. And she, she started very early in the morning, let's say three or four o'clock in the morning. She swam all the way. And by the afternoon, late afternoon, the mist came up. And uh, she started becoming tired. And she said to her parents or her mother, I think, and those who uh, seconded her, that she's tired and they must uh, put her into the boat. And they said, we are nearly there. We are nearly there. Just go. But with the mist, they couldn't see. And eventually she gave up in that round and they put her in the boat. And they were just behind the break of the waves. And then when they got on the beach, of course, there were some radio interview people there. And she said something like, and this is how I know the story, uh, I don't want to make excuses, but if only I knew where I was going, I would make it. I could make it. Now, if the mist come up, we tend to lose vision. And then we tend to give up. And just practical on the ground, one or two things for those who work hard and really try their best. One or two things. When you set your own goals, and you work at your own goals, don't let the bigger picture of sometimes despondency or organizational issues take your view away from what you set yourself out, out to do, what your vision is, what your mission is. Don't become vague about that. Follow your goals because that's motivational. I have it that um, it was during the time of Obama that he visited um, um, uh, Cape Canaveral uh, and he asked one of the ground workers, what do you do? And it was a cleaner. And the cleaner said, I put people on the moon. And remember, whatever your position, what the big picture is, why you are doing it. You, you are making a difference on the planet. And never, ever forget that, that, that vision. And when I, three o'clock in the morning, which happens quite often, cannot sleep, then I remind myself of two things. And that is the one thing is that 
I'm extremely fortunate to be a change agent, to be somebody who can help change and create a better planet. But the one thing I try not to do, I try not to carry the guilt feelings that we now have and take make that my own. And specifically to the young people who might be listening or not listening, I don't know. Somebody once said, um, it is not your fault that things went wrong. Don't carry the guilt, but do carry the responsibility. And don't carry the guilt, but do carry the responsibility. And how do you regenerate yourself? My last comment about that. You know what, Kathleen? There was a guy, Ralston III, who wrote a book in, also in the 60s. And he referred to tourism, ecotourism. And he said we must distinguish between recreation and recreation. Oh, what's the difference? Recreation is what we do when we go out and we bungee jump and we parachute and we, uh, and we somehow go four by four, challenge nature, and we are sort of just recreating and challenging. But re-slash creation is back to the creation, back to nature. So if you feel yourself tired and a little bit visionless, just do what you are trying to do by going into nature and just recreate yourself for a while, sitting there, just feeling, touching, immerse yourself in nature again, and the energy comes back because stress, and that's another lecture on its own, stress is energy. And even if you're in a city, the other day I was in Mauritius and there was this big tree and my family didn't see me. And I went and I touched the tree. Massive tree. Somebody lives in the tree. But I touched the tree. And it's like I get anchored again. Just go and touch a tree. That's the basics that I want to say. So I hope it makes sense to you. Uh, but there I can carry on for a long time. I better stop now. I see we're running out of time. Sorry about that. Kathy. No, I absolutely loved it. As I said before, I really, really enjoy your passion and your your enthusiasm and the way you kind of want to share that and, and try and pull other people in with that as well. And um, we've got a question coming through from Winnie. Um, hi, Winnie. Always lovely to see you. Um, and her question kind of tailors into one that I was going to ask you as well. So it kind of works nicely. Um, and she's asking, is there one thing that you that would help the work you do better? Or are you content you have reached your goal? No, reaching the goal. <laughs> no, no, no. You know, personal goals, yes. But we to collectively have a huge, huge um, responsibility to work towards planetary goals. Okay, so what, thing, what one thing would help my work? I would rather say what would help our work. You, you know, there's, there is not just one thing. It's a multidisciplinary multifaceted things that we have to do. But if I can say one thing that would change the world of biodiversity protection and nature conservation, I think that it all starts with the education of girl, woman, and woman. I really, really think so. And then I, when I say education, I'm not just talking environmental education, just education. I firmly believe that there's a direct correlation between socioeconomic, your socioeconomic situation and the number of children. There's a lot of studies being done on that. And educated women uh, play a much, much 
bigger role and they are the mothers who 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 are actually teaching the kids to go forward and the difference that can be made if we really focus on the world on the education of young girls young women and women is going to change this world and just another story i always have a story to tell during the um uh, uh, the war the civil war in mozambique i spent six years of my life there um during the war uh, doing an outreach uh, charitable outreach program and you know those children they were not just orphans they were like ants they moved where the soldiers went and they had to hide in the bush they had no place to stay they died literally died of hunger and then once i went up to the border and that's where it all started where this outreach program started and i met maria and i had a translator with me and i had a chat with maria and i asked her what do you need and she said of course we need food we are dying and then i met maria's two co-workers and then later the soldiers around allowed me to go into the war zone and maria and her two co-workers were looking about after about five to six hundred children who were orphanages from both sides Rilama, Rilama and Frilin, who just lived there they 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 used to suck animal skin because that was the only thing that they could get some taste for but maria and her two co-workers they kept these young children together in a disciplined way and one of the most beautiful things i've seen in my life was when those children for the first time we moved them towards the border out of the war zone and they started singing and it was maria and her two co-workers the mothers the women education general education will change this world that's what our organization need that's what your organization need this is what i think the one game changer in the world that we all need uh long answer again to a short question sorry for that Seems there's a bit of a lag in the line, Kathleen. <laughs> no, I can, I, no, Chris, you never need to apologise. It's totally fine. Um, and I completely agree with you on your points. Um, so to finish up, if people are um, watching and they're wanting to support the work that you're doing, what's the best way for them to be able to do so? And what kind of call of action? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, Kathleen, if that's your last question. Um, if people want to support the work you're doing, what's the yeah. best way to do that? Okay. The first thing you need to do is do your own work properly and dedicate yourself to your course. That's the first thing you need to do. But if you are interested in helping us, it is around Share Screen Africa. We we need more nodes in Africa. And the nodes are those people who in a country say, okay, we're going to um, create awareness of this service with colleges, training institutes, and, and, and create that awareness so that they can start coming into this virtual classroom, which at the end will form a virtual library on YouTube. We need people to be presenters. Now, it is the, the presenters can be international, but we focus on the classrooms in Africa. So if you know of presenters who could help us present certain topics, also on the other side, you yourself might be um, accountant. 
or you might be have an MBA degree and you do courses on, let's say, leadership, group dynamics, um, things that we can apply in the world of conservation because there's gen general themes and topics there that is generic to everybody. We can put that out there for the students to learn. And the one thing I'm very chuffed about, but we've just, just started with this, we are really, really excited about it. And that is we are now looking at conservation leadership for conservationists and beyond. So our focus is going to move away from just conservation students or conservationists in training. We now want to start focusing on the engineer, on the builder, on the plumber, on, uh, on the architect, on the lawyer, to become the voice in Africa, the young leaders to create awareness amongst themselves that they also have a responsibility in their field and they could become the leaders, the future conservation leaders. And uh, we saw absolutely inception phase with that, but very, very excited about that. But if you want to get involved, share Screen Africa, tell us about presenters, announce yourself as a presenter, become a node in an Africa country and create awareness of this service, link your colleges and training institutes. And, uh, and I think with that, I've said enough. Thank you, Kathleen. Thank you so much, Chris. I think my Wi-Fi is about to die, so it's probably a good job to, uh, that we try and wrap up now. But I really appreciate you taking the time to come on um, and for sharing your story. Again, your passion is so obvious and it's so appreciated. And uh, all the comments we've had so far have been incredibly complimentary and lots of people cheering you on and appreciative of the work that you're doing. Um, is there anything else you'd like to say before we say goodbye? Yes, I do need some food now. It's late. <laughs> but uh, I, I just think that I myself have zero, zero training in conservation, in the hardcore conservation, doing um, um, botany or studying some other BSc. I've lived in a national park, yes. But I believe... The future of conservation is no longer in the hands of those who are on the ground doing it. The future of conservation is in the hands of the economists, in the hands of, um, of the people who see where we are heading. And it is a collective owned thing now and no longer just the ranger or just the one who runs the canine unit. As much as we love and appreciate them, you are the conservationist. And I am a conservationist, being an industrial and organizational psychologist. That's what conservation needs to become. That's my last word. Thank you, Kathleen. Thank you so much, Chris. And you've summed it up perfectly. So anyone watching back home, don't feel like you need to be a scientist or have a degree in conservation. Everything that you can bring to the table or anything you can bring to the table is always massively appreciated. So thank you, everyone, for watching. Thank you, Chris, for coming on. I've absolutely loved having you on. If you've enjoyed the show, please give it a like, comment and share. The more people that see it, the more awareness we can raise. If you're watching this and it's not live and you still have a question you'd like to ask, pop it in the comments section and we will get back to you. But for me and from Chris, for now, enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kathleen, and good night to everybody. Appreciate the time and the opportunity. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.